Welcome to the Star of Grind. She's the founder of Archively. Let's give her a big round of applause. That sounds like really low energy, guys. You know how Derek likes it. Um, we want to do a like, quick temperature check in the room. Um, how many of you are founders of companies that are, are early stage? And how many of those of you are engineers? And how many of you are in here looking for jobs? Okay, let's see those, those people. And how many people are hiring? Okay, just to give you guys a roadmap. So I am so excited um, for you to uh, hear all of the wisdom that Adam Sony has to share uh, with us tonight. He is the CTO and co-founder of Yammer, which just, I think you all know, uh, was acquired by Microsoft for $1.2 billion. Um, and so we're going to give him a nice startup grind welcome. Does everybody, can we just practice that one time? Ready? How many of you have been here before? No, you need to lead the room. Okay, ready? We're gonna like stand up and cheer. One, two, three. Woo! Okay, all right, and here. All right, that, that was practice, but all right, we're just gonna do it. Wow, that was a lot of energy. I know, we gotta, was... gotta get the energy. So guys, we're gonna, um, just to give you a little roadmap of what we're gonna be talking about tonight, we're gonna, in the first half, we're gonna talk about um, Adam's background and uh, Yammer and the Yammer acquisition, and we're going to kind of move into a little bit about where the future is with Yammer and Microsoft, and, and then we're going to get into more high-level philosophy that uh, Adam has about uh, organizational um, culture, structure, and how to build a company versus product, and then we will get to questions. So just kind of give you a sense of what, where we're going with this. Welcome. Thank you. So um, to start, because you know we like to do like actor studio start. Where were you born? I was uh, originally born in uh, New York, in Long Island. Any New Yorkers? New Yorkers? Me. Anyone? No. But moved when I was four. 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 And uh, now grew up in Phoenix. Which anyone from Phoenix? Good. No. Terrible place. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then ended up moving to uh, Los Angeles in ninety, late ninety four, early ninety five, because of the. Dot com boom. Oh, I skipped an important part. Uh, dropped out of high school after, ju uh, after I was a junior. Okay. Uh, Didn't know that. To go to college. Went to college for a year. Dropped out to start a company. So I have a junior high diploma. No GED. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's, that's, um, yeah. so, so in terms of making those choices early on, what, uh, what, was there anyone in particular in your life that influenced you? And, and obviously your parents were okay with that? They were, <laughs> they, <laughs> not initially. I mean, when I, I, the way it happened was I actually, I mean, Phoenix is a terrible place with terrible people. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but the school was just not that good and, and I, I like to learn and, and all that. So I went to the guidance counselor and said, I do like to learn, what can I, can I test out? And she said, there's no way to test out in this district. Can I switch to another district? There's no way to switch to another district. And she said, you should just drop out, go to college. And so I said, all right. And I told my parents, they were kind of against it at first, but then they somehow or another ran into some of my teachers and, and asked them, what do you think? And the teachers were like, yeah, school sucks. You should let them go. So okay. <laughs> that's what happened, yeah. So how did you make your way to technology? So I was really lucky. Uh, I'm 36, so I was born in 76, and my brother was three years older. And in elementary school, uh, we, there were no computers, and uh, they got one computer. It was an Apple II Plus, and uh, it was in the AP classes where my brother was, and nobody knew how to use it, and my brother was kind of figuring it out. And they said, take the computer home, figure it out, and then bring it back. And so he, he took it home, and we were the only ones around with a computer, and and I basically, I was uh, probably um, eight or something, or seven, and just started playing around with the computer, got really interested in it, and then took like a summer programming class uh, in third grade. Okay. Uh, and everybody else was like in fifth and sixth or seventh grade. And So you had these skills already before you decided to drop out of high school? Yeah, okay. yeah, I had been doing, I had like a BBS and you know, terrible, I was a nerd, okay. super nerd. So let's fast forward. I, I, we have so much to cover yeah. tonight. I just want to kind of fast forward to when you met David Sachs and uh, and Jeannie, and kind of yeah. the the pre 
the pre days of Yammer. Yeah, so I'll give you the, like the, the cynical sort of how I ended up with David. <laughs> so uh, it, and to go back to, to complete the story, in 95 uh, started a web development company called C Nation, ran, ran it until 2001. It was me, a best friend of my brother. Super, you know, we got it to like 30 employees and a couple million in sales. Pretty, it was incredible. We were really young, super idealistic. We were all going to be rich, whatever. And uh, we, we had had a company that was about to acquire us. It was a big deal. And, about a, and then the, the whole market crashed. It was 2000, 2001. And we were, I think, like a week away from signing this agreement to sell the company. And then the whole thing fell through. And so I left feeling extremely... Uh, uh, like the whole startup world was is a sham, you know, just like I can't believe and felt very disenchanted and ended up actually taking a couple of years moving to Mammoth Lakes and just working a snowboard shop, renting snowboards. And that was awesome. <laughs> and then I kind of got sucked back in and ended up working at a company called Shopzilla as their director of WebEng. Um, but I, I kind of had said I wasn't going to go back to startups because I felt you had to really know someone. And so anyway, long story short, I had an engineer named uh, Amos Ellison, who, who's now here in the city. This was in LA. And he got poached by a company called Genie right in the very beginning uh, by a guy named Alan Braverman, who lives like down the street. Uh, and for six months, Amos tried to recruit me. And finally, I, I said, uh, I, was, I was ready to leave. I was going to like just do something very different. But then I met David Sachs. And I realized that, wow, not only is he really smart, but I knew that he was the kind of person that could raise money, that could that had good ideas, that he was clearly like steeped in this world that I wasn't in at that time. And so I kind of took a shot on it, you know. And I was just, I was very impressed with his openness. Like he, it, it, status didn't seem to matter or whatever. He just like, if you could argue with him on, on principle or on ideas, that's all that really mattered. And, and that's how I ended up there. So you, what was the role that you went, on, uh, went to Genie in? Like what was the yeah. role? Throughout my career, I've kind of gone back and forth between management and, uh, and, and engineering. And at Shopzilla, I kind of started as an architect and was a manager for a while uh, and then kind of took this weird architecture role. And when I went to Genie, I ended up working for the engineer who I had been his boss. So, like, I had been his boss, then he was my boss. And it was awesome because, like, I was the one who could leave at Friday night and be like, well, it's your problem, boss, <laughs> you know. Uh, but he – and so, yeah, I was just, like, an architect engineer. I built their like newsfeed, which was sort of prescient, right? Uh, which ended up being this sort of big, distributed, complicated project. And so when Yammer, when uh, David started to have the idea for Yammer in late 2007, within Genie, within Genie, uh, and, and frankly, in the beginning, his idea was just—it was literally just the vision that there's this new form of communication called social that is revolutionizing the way we communicate in our personal lives. It's sort of upgrading the way we can communicate, and that is going to go to the enterprise. And he was not an enterprise guy. None of us were. Just that was the core belief. And I was just, who knows why he chose me. I think he knew that, like, I don't know. But he came to me and said, look, we're going to start this thing. Do you want to lead the engineering? And I said, yes. Still within Genie. Yeah, still yeah. within Genie. Okay. And so, yeah. And so um, then you launched it. TechCrunch. TechCrunch. We spent six, this was myself, a guy named Zach Parker, another guy named Chris Gale, still with the company, all of them, and are all leaders now. Um, worked on it for about, from January to when we launched it in September. Just the three of us, we kind of built the first version with some help from Genie people. And then we launched at TechCrunch 50 and won. And at the time, it was really controversial, too, because David was very well known, and there were all these people that thought, oh, it's not fair, you know, like David's, it's, we're not even a startup. And we really, it was three people, it was a startup. Uh, but I remember being at the award ceremonies, knowing for sure we weren't going to win. Like, we, there's no way they would give us the award. Uh, and then they kept narrowing it down. And even at the, when there was, like, two people left, I was sure we would not win. And then we won, and it was just like, oh, my, what the hell is going on? Yeah, it was kind of crazy. But we were still in L.A. at the time. A year later, we ended up moving here to San Francisco. So, um well, I'm going to flip to something within the early days because I've heard you talk about this before where um, we talk about early hires and people that can affect the team very early on. Yeah. And there, there were some things around that for you guys with Yammer, I remember you saying, and, and kind of the, the implications that that has over time. Obviously, a lot of people with early stage companies care a lot about who they're hiring and who they're bringing on as co-founders, et cetera, and 
what are your thoughts on those implications of really yeah i mean in place a, a theme that that has, will come up a lot and comes up a lot for people like myself and zach and chris the early people was how much we had learned through our past failures that like we had we felt we really had failed forward to this you know to this moment um and we kind of had a, had visions in our head of the kind of engineering org we didn't want to build we kind of knew more about that than knowing what we did want to build that wasn't as clear uh what we knew was that Engineering organizations had overemphasized engineering and underemphasized product, as an example. And later on, we sort of put language to it that there are like product -y engineers and engineering engineers. And it's not that the product -y engineers are any less intelligent or can code any worse. It's just that their concerns are about the end user experience. And, and when they're making decisions about uh, where to prioritize or, or, or how to build, it's sort of with the, it's like what's best going to be best for the user of the product. The engineering engineers are the ones that are like, man, I want to work on this cool technology. So I'm going to make a decision which will impact the product because I want to work on this technology. And so we really wanted to avoid that. And we got, it's unbelievably lucky that the first uh, 10 or so people ended up being incredible leaders. Uh, Jim Patterson, who was just an engineer, is now, he became our chief uh, product officer. He's now had a product fall of Yammer. Uh, Chris Gale is our VP of engineering. He's up at Microsoft talking about our engineering methodology, all that. I mean, unbelievable leaders. And I think what it taught us is the importance of that, that there's a temptation early on to hire like the genius coder who's gonna go off in a corner. I, I think that especially early on, you have to essentially hire people who can replace yourself. That, you just, that, that are not the same as you, but if you were to die, you'd be like, wow, they could, this person could literally trust. continue on. Yeah, you could totally trust. And this idea of sort of continuously trying to obsolete yourself by who you hire and how you trust them. Chris makes the point that, you know, it, if you can manage to hire people smarter than you, then it's only natural to give them more and more of your work because they're better than you. And so I think we've continuously tried to do that. There, we joke that there's no way myself or Chris or any of the early engineers could get a job at Yammer today. There's just no way. I've heard other <laughs> founders say that yeah, too. there's no way, yeah. Um, okay, so so let's let's get back into like where you started hearing about the possibility that Microsoft was looking at you guys as a potential acquisition. I've heard a lot of different stories around how this happened. What have and you heard? I don't. I'm not even going to say what I heard. But like, I, <laughs> um, I, 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 I'd like to know how it all started. Yeah, it was a yeah. I guess okay. <laughs> It was it was really nutty. Um, uh, when it, it they came to us at one point, they called us basically. The head of Microsoft Office called us, and he he reports directly to Steve Ballmer, so he's a pretty senior guy. And it was a weird call. He called David, and I think later on, as David recounted, it was like, did they get the wrong number or something? Like, did they recognize who we are? So you didn't know this. You had no relationship with None this whatsoever. person that Our, called you. Okay. We had kind of a frenemy relationship like we were in this weird uh they, they their products weren't a social ours helped make their products social but we were also competing with them like we were trying to beat them in a lot of areas and 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 more than that fundamentally we were building a product which was built for end users and was supposed to empower end users and the impression of their products was not that that it was built for it and and so when they called us we were like you obviously have the wrong you meant to call another company that begins with j and ends with Ive or something, um, <laughs> because that was more along their lines. And so we, we said, all right, we'll meet with you. And we began to tell them what we thought we were about, like w that the product was sort of a small piece of what we were and, and that you, know, you, you can't take away the, all this other stuff from the product. And they just really got it. I mean, it was, I remember our first meeting, it was me and David and uh, Jeff Teeper and, and uh, Kurt Delbeni. They just really like lit up and felt that they were in a, a point of, of transformation and wanted to figure out how to build for users and how to like get back to that world yeah. and saw what we were doing. And so it was, it was through that, that we, and through multiple meetings of that that we realized that, oh man, we're, we're actually on the same page. We had this one all day meeting. It was supposed to go over the business and the org chart. and We were supposed to do like a whole day and we got to none of it because in the beginning of the day, I went first and began to talk to them about our development methodology and stuff, and that was the entire day. They just asked all these questions about how we organize and how we deal with this and why we did this, and they were just so interested in it all uh, that it was, 
that's kind of what made us feel comfortable uh, realizing that it was, it was the right move. And there was that moment at the end of that day that you felt like this could really happen. Yeah, I mean, we... When did you know that it was going to happen? You know... And it happened really fast, too, right? It happened really... It, it took very little time. We... A number of companies have approached us uh, over the years to acquire us. And we, we had, you know, acquired a little bit here and there, but it almost never happens. Companies get approached all the time, and so we, are, we tend to be very skeptical. Mm. And so even as they were asking us questions, and we were, we were being honest with them, we really didn't think it was going to actually happen, you know? We didn't want to sell out. We, we, we wanted to continue our mission, so we weren't going to just let them buy a product and pick us apart. Um, we, it had to be really, really right. And even then, it, w it took a lot of convincing of ourselves because we just believed in what we were doing so much. You know, as I, as I recount sort of that, that, those months, like in the beginning, it was like two months. Um, it was just myself and David Sachs and, and Mark Woolway, who was our CTO who knew. And it was really difficult because there was a lot of due diligence and, and only we knew and it took all our time. I was working two jobs, basically. And I, in my life, never experienced this much personal stress, where it's like, during the day I'm doing a job trying to hide the fact that at night I'm doing like um, security and open source due diligence with five law firms and totally Because how many insane. people knew in the organization that this was Three going people on? For, Three people. For the entire time until like two weeks. Wow. Or two or three weeks. And so then we had to like tell a couple more people. Uh, and I feel like one of my, one of my proudest memories of, of building Yammer will always be the fact that when we we told all the early people, we told Chris and Zach and, and Matt Knopp and them, who none of these people had had a successful exit historically. None of them had a lot of money. And all of them stood to do pretty well in the acquisition. And yet when we told them that Microsoft was going to acquire us or, or was likely to, they all had the exact same reaction, which is like, we're not done yet. We're not, it, forget the money. We're not, I'd rather just go for it and fail and make nothing because like we're, we're they just believed in what we were doing so much. We had drowned ourselves in Kool-Aid, which was a good thing I'm saying. You know, we, we believed it so much. And it was really only by them getting convinced and understanding through talking to them that we were both on the same mission and they were going to let us not only continue our mission, but that we would be able to uh, accelerate it with, with the sort of tools and the reach that they had. So there's, a, there's an interesting personal story in there um, about a meeting that you had to have and some personal choices about taking it, like you said, it was a very personal, stressful time for you. You, yeah. had, a, you had a bad injury from a car accident? Yeah, it was, <laughs> um, it was last year, uh, this year, will we'll by far go down as the craziest year of my entire life. It's, it'll be impossible to beat this year. Knock on something. Um, so in, in I, I hadn't had a vacation in four years. I'm just building Yammer. I'd taken a day off here and there. I'd never taken a day off. And then a really good friend of mine was in the Peace Corps in uh, Kyrgyzstan, which is kind of near Kazakhstan and all these other, the lesser known Stan, borders China. And a, a, a mutual friend of ours decided, I want to plan a trip out there, but not just to go visit, but we want to do a backcountry snowboarding trip in these mountains that border China. Like, it was just as crazy an idea as possible. Uh, and I lived in Maryland, so I was, you know, experienced backcountry boarding and stuff. And I was just like, look, chance of a lifetime, I'm going to take a vacation and I'm going to go do this. I'm going to take two weeks, which is unheard of. Like, I had four years. Uh, long story short, uh, super cold, flew there. Uh, they lost our luggage. There was like a week of sort of staying in a hostel and not changing clothes or showering. Finally, our luggage comes at like four in the morning. It's like below zero. We get in like a taxi to, to get across the country. We were in the capital, Bishkek, and we, were, we got a taxi to go across the country to a really remote village to begin trekking into the mountains and got in a horrible car accident in the middle of nowhere in Kyrgyzstan, like worst place in the world, hit a tree at about 60. And uh, we, the three of us who were in the car were all pretty badly injured. This was just February of this last year. And uh, we, there was like, it was, it was scary. There was a couple days of third world country hospitals, like having to refuse pain meds because they had like old needles and they clearly didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, the U.S. Embassy got involved. There was a moment when some people in the States were helping. They thought they would have to hire like a private security firm to come and extract us. And I remember, wow. yeah, I, um, 
uh, Tanya, who's over there. She had to go to the CTO and or CFO and say, "Look, if we need to borrow one hundred fifty thousand dollars to pay this firm to get out of Mount, would we could we do that?" And he was like, "Yeah, of course." Uh, and so it ended up. It's good that your company values you. I know. And then ended up getting Medivac to Dubai, and then from there made it home. And it turned out I had, uh, I, and I was probably the middle injured one. I had um, severed off the humeral head, the kind of ball of your, your humerus, completely severed it off, and then fractured the ball and fractured the humerus. And so I needed to get, I have a plate and nine screws now in my arm. Uh, and so that period, just February, that was February. It was a really rough period. It was a lot of, it was the surgery, and it was a really rough recovery. It was very, very painful. And then that's right when it all started. That's right when, like, the Microsoft thing started. And so I was having to go to PT many times a week, um, and there was an upcoming surgery that I was supposed to do in May, a second surgery to get the plate out. And on that day of that surgery, I was supposed to, it was like a last-minute thing, go up to Microsoft to meet Steve Ballmer uh, with a one-on-one -on -one for the first time. He had never, I had never met him, you know. And I had to make this decision to like cancel my surgery to go meet Steve and uh, end up being a really good thing because I ended up getting a second opinion. They, I didn't, we shouldn't have gotten the plate out. I don't know That's a surgery. hard decision to make. It was, it was really hard because I kept saying throughout this process, I'm going to not let it affect my health, you know? Yeah. And then it got down to like literally, are you going to get the surgery or go see Steve Bomber? And it was like, I, just, I mean, I had to do it because I felt like there were all these people that we're counting on this essentially like this was important well this, so. is, a, this is a huge topic right of of how how people i mean what's your life like now i work all the time <laughs> is that surprising no yeah. of course not it does yeah. not but um and so has has um well, well tell us tell us the, your your story about when when the acquisition happened like where were you all right so then <laughs> it's just every moment was crazier than the last it seems so we we were, uh, yeah, we were coming up to the acquisition. It was, uh, there, was un there was literally like five law firms, a number of um, we independent companies that were doing due diligence. It was so much effort. And normally, there'd be more people on our end, but it was just like me and a couple of people. It was crazy. Uh, and then uh, I had this talk to give in New York, and it was supposed to be this really big talk. It was supposed to be like ten or 20,000 people as a keynote. And so that, that was a lot of people, and I wanted to prepare for it. So I spent a lot of time preparing in the middle of trying to do this acquisition. I'm like working on this huge keynote with this other agency and it was just ridiculous. It was silly. And so then I fly to New York and it's the week we're supposed to finish the acquisition. And so I'm supposed to fly to New York, do the talk and fly home really quickly to like sign paperwork. And, and I get to New York and I get to the, the talk. Or I get to New York and they've messed up my room. And so they like say, oh, sorry. And because we had, I don't know, give them money or something. They put me in this huge suite. In, in, in Manhattan for like 300 bucks a night, enormous, like the size of this room with a patio, like for just randomly. And so I'm like, all right. So I'm there all day working on the talk. And then I go to the talk and there's nobody there. It's, it's like a ghost town. It's, it's a tiny room. It's like maybe 80 people. And they looked like IT nerds. I just was like, what? How did I come here? Why am I here? You know? So I get out of the talk. I get ready to get on a plane. And then David Sachs calls me and says, you can't get on a plane. We, we could sign it any minute. You just have to stay there. And so for two days, I basically like got moved around hotel rooms in this hotel as they were like, well, you can't stay in that suite, so you got to come over. And then they put me in a bigger suite. And there was this night, it was like, I'm in this enormous suite. Again, it's like $300 a night just because they threw me in this thing. On this patio with the, the Empire State Building behind me, it's nighttime, but it's beautiful. And I'm just on the phone, and they're like, you got to sign this paperwork. I run downstairs, sign paperwork. It's like midnight, I'm just drinking this bottle of wine, just like, when is this going to end? A car's supposed to get me at five in the morning, and at two in the morning, they're like, deal's not gonna happen, you've gotta stay in New York. So I'm like, all right, so like, I call the, the front desk, and they're like, well, you can't stay in that room. So like two in the morning, I switch to this like, the smallest room they have. So I wake <laughs> up, and then they're like, and finally like, at, at something like, the car's supposed to get me like four in the afternoon to get to the airport, and finally at like 11 o'clock in the morning, for months now, I had, I had gone from a world with no email to for two months, a, a world of constant email. So all these agencies and law firms, just streams of email constantly. And then 11 a.m., uh, I signed sign my part of the paperwork, and I send it off, and then the email stops, and there's just silence, and nobody has anything to say, and we're just waiting for counter signature, just hanging out, nothing going on. Finally, like 4 o'clock, my car is supposed to show, pick, take me to the airport any second, get an email, it just says, bam, and it's Steve Ballmer's signature. And I'm just in this hotel room alone, and we just sold my company for 
1.2 billion. <laughs> and I like look at the, the mini fridge and there's like a little bottle of Johnny Black and I'm like, cheers, you know. <laughs> and then, then the phone rings and the car's there. I'm like, oh, I gotta go. And then that was it. So that was, that <laughs> that was, was like, the celebration. That was what happened, yeah. yeah. And then finally got to come home, yeah. So, so you have a little bit more money now. A little, yeah. Yeah. How has it changed you? Almost not at all. I, uh, you know, I had kind of decided a long time ago that I didn't want, ever want money to change me and I wasn't doing it for money to begin with. So I had, I had kind of decided what I would do if I had money, which is that not much, you know? Um, so it, honestly, it hasn't. I, I live in a, a small apartment in Potrero, which is pretty shitty and stayed there. I drive an Xterra, something I love. Um, the only thing I, I mean, I, come on, give us, give us one splurge. I, have, I, have, I bought a bike. <laughs> I bought a, I literally bought a bike, but this, my splurge was, and I'm not, I, I prescribe to, and I, I can't remember if it was Rockefeller or Carnegie, but this idea that like you should spend your money before you die because you can't control what happens at after that. And I have very meager needs. I'm enjoying what I'm doing. And so I, taken a big chunk of it and just put it into a donor advisory fund that I have to give away that I can't use for myself. And I'm excited about the, the idea of thinking about the ways we've disrupted our world and the enterprise and thinking about how to disrupt philanthropy and all that stuff. So I, I haven't even made many investments. I've invested in one company, um, but I haven't really done much. Okay. <laughs> well, and I, I was given this advice. It was very good advice. I would have done this anyway, but if you ever come into a bunch of money, don't change anything for a year. Mm. Because you kind of have to like settle into it and understand that, oh yeah, nothing really changes. And if, you, if a lot of things do change, then something's probably wrong. I was happy before I had money, so. What's the investment that you made? What uh, kind of company? I decided that, because I don't have a lot of time to think about enterprise startups or yeah. anything, that I would only invest in very, very weird disruptive companies. And so this one is a local company that's doing a DNA printer. They're trying to like make uh, creating synthetic, synthesized DNA super cheap and fast so that we can begin like a DNA hacker culture. And so they've developed a DNA printer. Cool. Yeah. And I'm looking at one of the company which is trying to disrupt government by, uh, I mean that sounds bad, but they, they, they <laughs> government has really bad Radical. tools and they're also very opaque. And so they want to build good tools for government that, oh, by the way, if you're using these tools, it makes you transparent, and it means we as citizens can compare governments and look at So they started with a budget tool. The, the company's called Delphi Systems, and I think Palo Alto launched it. And it's like, oh, if you, if you use this tool for budgeting, which is very hard and difficult for you, it'll be easier for you. Oh, and all your data, all your, your finances and stuff are public, which they have to be anyway. And if a lot enough cities do this, we can begin to compare cities. And so that was the other one. Okay. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about what your next thing is within Microsoft and Yammer and what it's like. I mean, a lot of founders, obviously, it's a goal to be acquired, right? And, and it's a very exciting thing. But at the same time, people that like to start companies also sometimes don't like to work at big companies. So what was the reaction, A, from everyone internally when you told them? And what has the... What has the integration been like? I think there was a lot of uh, trust capital we had built up in our company. And there was just a lot of trust in us that we were going to do the right things. So there was a lot of skepticism, uh, skepticism but a lot of people said, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see if, how it's really going to go. And to some degree, I think we're still in that period a little bit because there's a lot of weird corporate stuff you do have to go through about you're changing your HR systems and some of it's better, some of it's worse, a lot of it's worse. Um, but from a product perspective, it's been better than we had hoped because they, they did really get what we were trying to do and the importance. And so what we have found is that our, we had this guy who was the head of product who he left a while ago and after the acquisition, we were telling him, we are going to influence Microsoft. And he was like, yeah, everybody says that. And he bet, he bet me and Chris money that that wouldn't happen. And so what it, are the three things that have surprised you the most? It's the... It's the amount at which we have had an influence in that company. I mean, to How? give you an illustration, uh, yeah. a couple of illustrations. Uh, the, the guy who runs the pro product for Office was walking me around uh, this floor of this building that they had just renovated, 
And as he's walking around, and I don't know if you know, at Microsoft, engineers have their own offices, and it's very weird. Uh, they had opened it all up. They had said, no more offices. And he's like, you know what? We, had, we saw your office. It was so awesome. Look, we opened all these things up. He's like, look, I am not in an office anymore. This is the head of all of the product of office. I'm out on the floor. I don't have an office. None of my people, we wanted to lead by example. We want to be more open, transparent. We need to work together. And then he, he's walking us around. And he shows us this big board. We have this thing in here called the big board. This is part of our development methodology. He's like, does this look familiar? I was like, he's like, it's the big board. He's like, we're doing, you know. And there were, there's been these <laughs> moments where like we were talking to the people who build Office or, or um, Outlook and they'll be showing us some stuff in the future and they'll be like, yeah, and you click here and this happens and we'll be like, well, why are you doing that? Why, why wouldn't you do this? And they'd be like, oh, you think we should do that? Like, yeah. All right. Yeah. And we're like, oh my God, we just like mentioned something and there's going to be a change that will affect hundreds of millions of people because in reality they were pretty open and, and they, they kind of knew that, uh, they kind of knew that in the last decade they had done, they, in, in 2000 they were like, criticized by enterprises that you guys are like a consumer company you don't understand enterprises and they were like oh and so from 2000 to 2010 or 11 they just were like we got approved enterprises we understand them and they totally succeeded and then they kept going you know like they and they kind of over indexed for it and now they're like man we got to get back to really building for users and understanding how to do that and so they're so hungry and they're and they're moving to the cloud they're moving everything in the cloud and they don't even they don't yet get all this the importance of that and so we're there telling them, like, look, this is how you do it. This is why it's important. This is super interesting. I mean, we're, between Chris and I, we're up there talking all the time, doing talks in front of, like, their research groups. And, and they're just super interested in, like, new development methodologies and new ways of thinking of releasing and building products. They've, we don't build anything on, our, on the Microsoft stack. No comments whatsoever. There's no pressure whatsoever. At no point do they were like, you have to stop using Ruby and Java. It's totally, and despite everything that we thought ahead of time. And and so you're in then you're 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 not looking to accelerate and invest out oh, and yeah. you're you're committed. Yeah, you know it always it always struck me as funny that you've all these startup people like us and they always say you know I, I want to work at a startup I don't want to work at a big company, which always struck me a little weird because if you're what's your goal at a startup it's to build something big hopefully and so if you want to be successful you're gonna have to figure out how to build a really good big company, essentially. Or you just want to be mediocre and stay small forever, or maybe have a niche idea. Um, and so w when we think about integrating with Microsoft and dealing with a company of that scale, it's just like an enormous challenge that we, we there's no part of, of the experience that we have said, yeah, we don't want to try to fix that. Like every, we just, everything. We're just going to be like, well, that slows you down. Let's fix that. Yeah, HR, recruiting, whatever. There's better ways to do it, you know? And we're just being really bold about it. We have nothing to lose. Uh, and it's, it's fun. It's like, it's kind of fantastic. And, and as I've said before, it's, it's not about the size of your company. It's about the size of your impact. And if you're at a big company and you have no impact, you should leave. Um, but, and if you're at a small company and you have no impact, you should leave. But if you're at a big company and you have big impact, you have, that's a huge sounding board. That's a huge amplifier for the things you could do. And right now it feels like we have that amplifier. There's just uh, tremendous things we can do. And it's, so it's pretty exciting. If, if we fail and that turns out not to be true, then yeah, I'll move on to other things. But at the moment, seeing the impact, getting that feedback has been uh, very, very rewarding, yeah. Um, and you have talked before, uh, you've, you've given talks on the importance of building a company and not just a product, and that's the reason that you feel that this was actually so successful. And you've talked about some of these, um, can you talk a little bit about the, the disciplines, the, the, the four culture, yeah. high level philosophies that you have, that you, you have built Yammer off of? Yeah, and so kind of tell everyone a little bit about those. For, for you guys, for, I feel like you know, having gone through this now, um, an acquisition by a large company, uh, it's, it's helped me, it's solidified a belief that I had. Um, as startup people, we fall in love with the products we're building. We build it because we think, oh, we can see all these people using our products. And so you're an engineer, you're a business person, whatever, and you, you get really focused on this product you have to build. And in the beginning, you have to because if you don't have a good market fit, you shouldn't be doing it. So in the very beginning of your startup, all you are is like thinking product, product, product. But if you gain any success at all, if you have any hope, then at some point very, very quickly, you have to begin to change your focus. 
it's not that you, you're, you're not going to be focused on the product, but you have to become more focused on building the company that builds the product. Because if you just build a product, if that's all you are, and the rest of you is a mess and not well thought out, then anytime you get acquired or go public or whatever, the rest will just get disintegrated. Like that, that is why you hear these stories of startups getting bought and then getting trashed. Because now I've talked to a bunch of them. Because the big company's like, oh, that's a great product. You've got a bunch of users. All right, we're going to buy you. And then they, they look inside and they're like, holy crap. Like, what is all this stuff? You guys are... Okay, so what is that? Like, when you say holy crap, what is, what is, what is a mess? Like, explain that. Like, describe an example for someone so that they can say, I don't want to make that mistake. A mess is like you have no idea what people are doing or why. And, you know, you've, there, there's a lot of mistrust within the company. There's groups that are warring at that time. There's people that are unhappy. There's, um, uh, you're, you don't even know where your focus is on the product anymore. You're, uh, I mean, there's the, the normal business things of making sure your books are clean and stuff like that. That's almost the easy stuff. The, the, like when so it Microsoft, sounds like it's mostly about people. It's mostly about people and, and sort of organization. As a, as a startup grows, uh, especially a, a, a startup that involves engineering or whatever, we people tend to think of, of sort of organization as a separate thing. Like, okay, we've got a small group of people we're building, and now we're kind of bigger, and now we're all just sort of chaos, and now we have to organize. So, all right, we've got some front-end people. We'll make them a team. We've got some back-end people. It's just like an afterthought. And then it ends up being a mess, and I've been in – larger companies that were a mess because it was like, oh, there's a bunch of front end guys over there, there's a bunch of back end people over there. I don't know, we'll use Scrum or something to keep track of it all. It's, you know, it's not, that's not enough. And if that's all you have and that's all you are is this, is like a, a chaotic environment that, that has a cool product, then the environment isn't worth saving. Like the, the company isn't worth saving. You have to make your company worth saving if you have any hope of getting it saved, you know? So to an early stage entrepreneur, what are the tips that you would give in order to accomplish that? Because we can talk high-level philosophy, yeah. but like, if somebody wanted to go put that into practice tomorrow with their startup, what are like three key tips yeah. that it's, you would it, give? It's even a, it's, it's sometimes a little hard to to break it down <laughs> beyond the abstract because it is a little abstract. But I'll try to explain it. At the very beginning, uh, first of all, we knew we wanted to hire people smarter than us. Easy one. They got to be smarter than you. They've got to be. They, you have to be able to trust them. Second of all, you have to be in a. Just making them smarter make you trust them. Yeah. If you hire people smarter than you, then it's obvious you should. You should. You can delegate to them. It's very hard to okay. delegate to. And if you if you, you can't hire mini me's, you know, you can't hire little you's who are not quite as good, but do a piece you did. Okay. Like the goal isn't like I'm doing because in the beginning you're doing everything, and so then if you're like here's a person that can do one piece of who I am, that doesn't work. You want to hire people who you who you could delegate to because they're clearly better than you. <laughs> and that's really hard. And then this, the process of letting go, of getting ahead of letting go. I feel like startup founders hold on really tight to, to the, the nitty gritty for too long. But when really, like the way you build a company is by constantly being in the process of trying to obsolete yourself. It's impossible. But like, man, if you could obsolete, if you had a company that was so efficient and effective, it didn't need you, that's incredible. That's success. It's impossible, but like that's, and so this, you're, you know, at Yammer, we constantly uh, in leadership thought, yes, there's some stuff that's not working that's still requiring a lot of our energy. What are we doing wrong structurally, or organizationally? Where are there people not trusting each other? We have to fix those problems so they don't need our intervention all the time, which they always need your intervention. Um, and then the other part I would say, and again, since a lot of you might be in organizations that are building applications or web stuff, is like just get out of the whole, yeah, we'll just do Scrum. We'll just organize around architecture. Um, you have some specific things around. That's the big board. Is yeah. that the big board? Do you want to explain what the big board is? So let's see if I can summarize this really fast. So this, is, this is about like developmental like procedure. Yeah. So again, most companies tend to organize around areas of their product or areas of code or code bases, and we think it's all wrong because uh, our belief is like uh, the fundamental advantage of a startup is that you can move really fast. And if you lose that as you grow, then you're in trouble. And so we had this sort of the core value of engineering we looked at as sustained velocity, like delivering the product roadmap, sustained velocity. It's not just coding really fast. It's like over time, it's not buggy, but we can always move fast. And as we grow and we hire, we have 180 people in engineering and product now, and we are so fast. Because as we organize and we thought about our architecture and we organize teams, we had these questions, which is, is, will this slow us down or speed us up? 
when we, when we put work in that area, will they be able to do it on their own or will they need other people? And so what we came to our process is um, basically all projects are two to 10 people, two to 10 weeks. Keep it simple. Uh, nobody owns any code bases, nobody owns any p feature areas. We determine here's the project we're gonna work on, we're gonna need a Rails guy, we're gonna need a Java guy, whatever, and every engineer is only on one project at a time and not doesn't include support. And so the team is like, all right, here's your project, loose spec, go. And you can do whatever you want, touch any code base, you don't need to ask for permission, you guys are a little startup, you two to 10 people for two to 10 weeks. Uh, you're gonna be uh, data driven, and so you have, uh, uh, objectives as far as we're going to increase one day to retention or seven day retention and so you can release as much as you want but you're going to be done within two to ten weeks your scope and it will be done and then you're disbanded and then you're, some other group is formed so nobody like forms attachments to parts of the product or what how do you decide who to put together on these projects or you know how do you staff them it's it, it, so in the beginning we say well we have all these services and lots of languages and so it's like who would we need to put together to build this start to finish without asking for anyone's help? And we put them together, but just sort of randomly. I mean, the, the early, uh, one of the early innovations is we've decoupled product assignment from the org chart. We have an org chart, we have engineering managers who manage people, but they don't tell their engineers what to do. They have no, they don't, the, their engineers get assigned across functional teams, and one of the engineers is elected the tech lead, and they manage that project. And so every two to 10 weeks, different people on different teams, and there's a different tech lead, and every engineer gets to try to be tech lead, and it's incredible because <laughs> these tech leads are like mini managers. Like we get to see for two to 10 weeks how someone will do in management without committing to make them a manager. It's unbelievable. It teaches them how to, it teaches them humility. Because <laughs> one, the, one of the hardest things as a manager is you have these employees that are often difficult to deal with. And in, in my mind, I'm always thinking, I can't wait till you're a manager. And I hope you have employees like you, you know. Uh, and so the tech lead gives them that opportunity to like almost literally manage and they tend to be much more sympathetic <laughs> to management after that. Uh, yeah. It's worked unbelievably well, this system. We have, again, we have at any given time there, and these products come and go randomly. And the way we handle support is there's a cross-functional support team. We only hire senior, senior engineers. They all go on the support team for tours, you know, two to 10 weeks. So there are, there, there are periods of time when people are just fixing yeah. bugs. Uh, yeah, and they're senior engineers. They do their tour of two to 10 weeks, and their job is to protect the other engineers so that they can focus on their on project. Their product. And yeah. because it's one, because one engineer can only, because engineers can only be on one at a time, that team can be accountable to each other. They, can, they know that one of the uh, people isn't going to say, oh, I'm busy doing this, or I'm doing the support stuff. Nope, they're all focused. And, and they lose their team identity when they're on these cross-functional teams. One of them may have been a Rails guy, one of them may have been a, a Java girl, it doesn't matter. If they're on a cross-functional team, to help each other out, do whatever you need, then they blow up and they reform, essentially. It's, it's been unbelievable how well it's worked. But we've, comp we've iterated constantly, we've adjusted. We, we believe, and this is, if I have another thing I want you to take away. Everybody here knows about iterating on your product, that you have to iterate on your product. You have to iterate on your methodology, on your process, on your company, on your people. It's all the same. You have to, you, everyone should be okay being wrong, raising their hand, saying something's wrong. This person shouldn't be a manager. This, whatever it is, this process isn't working. And everyone in your company should know that everything's going to change all the time. I mean, you want to be sensitive. But we are constantly experimenting with, oh, this team's too big. How do we want to try dividing it this time? All right, well, let's try this and see what works. And we're just constantly trying to improve the way we think about growing the org and organizing in our process and teams form that are permanent and go away and it's it's fascinating and pe people it, it's weird at first because you think of organization as static but you get used to it and you realize how amazing it is because people have so much more patience you can make mistakes you will but everybody believes they'll be corrected mm. and they can point out when you've made mistakes so like making it really okay to be wrong and get, having everyone understand that it's everyone's responsibility to help improve the whole organization, the whole system. And that's also, um, does that, that ties into the philosophy of building a shared vision? Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you set a vision in order for everyone to be able to move among these different products and projects and how you keep everyone in the organization moving in the same direction? Yeah, you know, what we found looking back at other engineering orgs is that when you align engineers on a product area, like you're a search engineer or you're this, you know, 
they, they gain an attachment to it. And then, and, and you're also making an, an implicit prioritization that search is only as important as the three people staffed on search and never more or less, right? Uh, and it just doesn't work because the, the, who, the search engineers become narrowly focused. They think, well, the most important thing in the company is search because I've been on search for a long time and search is obviously really, you know. Um, when, you, when you remove that from the orchard, when you remove the product areas, it's actually easier to keep people aligned on the mission of the company. Like our, our mission was to um, help companies empower their employees so that they could become more decentralized, transparent, agile. That was our mission. And I think what's pushed Yammer to think about this so deeply is we believe that in order to bring that to our customers, we would really have to do a good job embodying that ourselves. That if we couldn't do that ourselves, there's no way we could ask our customers. And so there was a huge emphasis on decentralization, meaning like let people make decisions, decentralized decision making, uh, uh, transparency, like everyone should be able to see what's going on because that's how you establish trust. Do you trust. use Yammer to do that? Like, do you yeah, work I mean, every we don't use email. Every project on Yammer, every every engineering project is built using Yammer to communicate in a public group, so everyone in the whole company can see all the work being done. In Any public. other tools? Uh, we, you know, we, we were using like Google Docs and stuff like that, but we, we try to do as much in Yammer as possible because it was public. Yeah. And none of the other tools were as public. Right. Like if you go on Yammer today and you, you think of a project and you look for it, there's the group and you can see all the history of all their conversations and all the material they created and everyone who's working on it and anyone can get involved and say, hey you guys, you know, and that's been huge, you know. A transparency creates accountability. Like um, this guy Thornton Prime said, if, if you want to walk around with your shirt off, you're probably going to do more sit-ups, you know? Like, <laughs> transparency <laughs> creates accountability. Uh, we hope. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to experiment here. Um, but yeah, so it's, it, it, we, we sort of, at the highest level, we wanted to foster a culture that, that tr aimed for high velocity, decentralization, transparency, and like a culture of iterating on everything, of constant improvement. Let's talk about hiring just for one second because sure. I feel like there are a couple of things that you said that, you know, one thing you said earlier on was hire the producty engineers that care about the end user mm -hmm. and not to hire the engineers that just want to work on cool tech. Right. But there's also like this problem of finding good talent and not necessarily finding good talent, but it, I think everybody's talking about how hard it is to hire engineers and everybody's looking for them. And so uh, some beggars can't be choosers sometimes, right? You want to hire the right people, but like you also no, need to hire people. Choosers. Well, I guess you can. Okay. <laughs> but I, I'm, I, I'm, guess what I'm trying to say is, um, what would you, what would you recommend to, to people who are, are trying to hire and like how, what are, what are like the things that you look for specifically? So, I wouldn't ever lower your standards. You're, you're never too desperate to hire the wrong person. The biggest mistakes we made were around keeping the long, wrong people too long. And we in engineering got really good at knowing when people weren't right and moving them out. We, Yammer Engineering actually had a higher, we'll call it forced attrition rate than sales. Hmm. Like we were just diligent. And what we found was if, when you have engineers who aren't good, and you're in a transparent company. But is it they're, they're not good because they're not fitting in, or is it that no. they're not good because they can't code? Both. You okay. know, mostly it wasn't an engineering problem. It was that they weren't aligned, okay. right? Um, but oftentimes it was engineering. There's just some that aren't good enough, you know. Uh, you have to have a really high bar, and you just keep hiring better to raise the bar. Um, but if it, this is just a warning. Like, if you have a transparent culture, and you have engineers who, who aren't cutting it, they all know it. All your engineers know it. And if you fail to take action, you lose trust. Because okay, they're like, you have this like, guy. You know this. And you, you know, know this, this is guys, ruining yeah. my life, and you're not doing anything. <laughs> so, like, we, we sort of had to. Um, and, and what that also does is it makes you better at hiring. Because if you know that uh, firing is not fun, it's not easy, if you're strict about it, then you've got to be really good at hiring because you don't want to fire anyone. Uh, and so, we ended up creating this uh, page of, like, here's what we're looking for an engineer. And technology, technical acumen is, is a piece of it. And, but we found that's easy to test for. It's like actually easy to know if someone's pretty good technically. What's hard is, are they tenacious? Are they intellectually humble? Are they curious? Do they, are they good at abstract thought? Do they care about the user? You know? And so we, we, most of our interviews, and we do, our interviews work as a set of pair interviews. So you'll meet 
maybe four to six engineers as sets of pairs, and then like the hiring manager. And, and they're not grilling you, you know, they're, they're trying to make you feel comfortable, we want you to uh, enjoy. I mean, from an early days, and I recommend this too, we said, everyone who interviews here should want to work here, whether we hire them or not. Because they should be, if they don't get the job, they should be telling all their friends, man, I really wanted that, because that will help you. So you, you want everyone to feel great about the company and interviewing there and they had a good experience. So even if they were bad, we just really wanted them to feel good about interviewing, you know. Um, but we spend most of our time on those things, on judging them on, you know, are they defensive? Like, do they feel like they can be open, they can accept failure? Are they curious? Are they just techier? Do they care about the user? Do they um, want to learn? Are they, are they sort of locked into rigid ways of thinking, you know? There are all these soft things that end up being far more important for engineering today than technology. And again, it's not that we don't test for technology, it's, it's easy, it's easy to, you know, you, it, it's just not that hard to ask a couple to questions. Figure out whether like, someone actually can code. Yeah, do they know yeah. what they're talking about, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anything else that you wanna add or talk about before we move to questions? Like any messages that you wanna I think leave the audience with? It's just sort of this, I don't know what stage everybody's at when you're in a small startup, I think it's, it's awesome to be able to focus just on the product, but there are these unbelievably interesting challenges in figuring out how to build a company that builds the product you want to build. And I find that it's, it's, it, to be interested in that is a skill actually far beyond the ability to like build a product yourself. And so focusing on that aspect of yourself and thinking about how to develop that part of yourself I think is, is understated and, and important. And in fact, we all probably here in Silicon Valley uh, know about companies that were, became successful, I won't name any names, who became big and whatever, but we've now heard are kind of messed up on the inside. Mm. Like, they're financially successful, lots of users, but man, they're a mess. <laughs> Going to think of a couple? I won't name any names, but <laughs> like, and just don't be that company. It's very yeah. easy to be that company. It's super easy. Uh, and it, it takes a lot of, of discipline, I think, to think beyond that level of the product, you know? It always fast. I, I wasn't, you know, I, I was in LA, I was in Phoenix, just came here three years ago, and it blows my mind how this is a city that like thrives on this shared delusion uh, that we're all going to make it rich. And I'm a terrible poster <laughs> child for this, of course. Um, Never happens. Yeah, and it does, but like, I guess the only other thing is like, and I don't think everyone here suffers from that, but it just can't be about that because it's unlikely anyway, uh, and it doesn't. You know, it's, it's just about impact. It's just about, if you just focus on impact, then at the very least, you will do something good and be happy for it. That's a nice note to end on, I think. Um, I want to open it up to questions, because I'm sure there are some of them. Yeah? Okay, so um, I'm going to, how are we going to do the mic thing? Actually, I'm going to have, if you have questions, let's have you come over to the side and um, do you want to try and get them on video? Okay. So we're going to just have you guys line up on the side here. Hi. Hey. How are you? Good. Greg Newfeld. Nice hey. to meet you. So um, with, uh, with web-based software, a lot of the rule is kind of, you know, 10% of the users make up 90% of the content. Mm -hmm. And within my organization, I see a lot of that on Yammer as well. How do you encourage more people to be proactive around the organization, whereas you know hiding behind email is something that more people are comfortable doing, and broadcasting something with their face next to it is a little bit uncomfortable, and especially for the older folks. I I'm, I could talk about this forever, so I'll try to make it brief. So there's two ways basically. Um, it turns out making companies more transparent and open, accepting a failure, is not at its root a technology problem. It required sort of social communication to solve, but that alone couldn't solve it. And so we, we offer this technology and we, and we do what we can to make the software easy to use and good and require very little training. But at the end of the day, it's a combination of we have a pretty large arm of, we'll call them consultants, they're the, our, our customer engagement arm, that helps companies figure that part out, which is, and, and I, I, the rules are often easy, which is, you wanna change your whole company? Start small, like let's figure out some small things and work your way out from there, because you have to prove the value over time. Uh, and then there's just a, there's a movement out there right now to rethink how we shape companies, and, uh, and Yammer's a bit of a magnet for them, and so sometimes they kind of come to us. There's incredible people like um, 
like Chris Laping is the CIO of Red Robin, which is hamburgers, but he's just like, he, you wouldn't know the difference between him and him and I, because he's like transparency and decentralization and, you know, like th there, there's a lot of people that get it. And I think Yammer becomes a magnet for some of them as well. The, the, the short answer is it's hard and, and it starts with small steps. It starts with saying, all right, well, we have this problem. Uh, I'm, instead of solving it the old way, Let's try to create a, let's take a group of, let's say we want to improve customer experience. You're, whatever, you're a shipping company. All right, normally we would hire an expert, you know. Instead of that, let's take a guy on the front lines, person here, person here, put them together, put them in a, in a public group in Yammer or something, and say, how would you solve the problem? And just seeing the, like, the velocity of how quickly the people in the know and in the front line can solve a problem, it begins to become obvious. Or like, we have these uh, call center people, and they, they, they're wasting tons of time because they don't have all the answers. What if they could be connected to the company and get answers? Oh my God, that saves so much money. And then it just sort of spirals from there. But I, there's almost no company that's, that's very far along now. Um, when you look for things like decentralization, you hear people like the CEO of Johnson & Johnson talks a lot about it. There's companies doing this. I, I honestly think within 10 years, we're gonna see a very fundamental reshaping of the way we organize companies and it'll be far more around adaptability than, than just doing the same things over and over with increasing efficiency. So it's just sort of happening and we're trying to accelerate it, but it, with or without us, it'll probably happen. Sure, but right now it's the power of the question mark, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Use the question mark and more people will answer. Yeah, you, it's a small, you find a need you know, that's small that yeah. you can sort of affect change on and spiral out. Oh, that makes sense, thank you. Sure. Thank you. How's it going? Good. Uh, I'm Mike Brown. I uh, work upstairs. Um, as you sort of crafted your vision for Yammer and you sort of wanted to make your impact and then you sort of started talking to Microsoft, you mentioned they could actually help accelerate or push it further. And I'm wondering what it is that you saw in them and what, how, whatever your, the vision is, how are they going to actually help accelerate it? Yeah. Good question. I, I don't run the office division and so I'm not making a prediction about the product roadmap or disclaimer. Uh, Yammer was, as I said, uh, building a tool to empower employees and all that, but the, the manifestation of that, we believed, was going to be the sort of communication hub of your company, where, where that would span all the apps you use, whether they're from other companies or not, didn't matter, and it would be where you went to communicate and collaborate and create content. And So we were building what we thought of, and I, the name we played with, but it was like the social intranet. It's this re-envisioning of the intranet, the place you go when you get to work in the morning, but it's very open and social. And it turned out that they had a lot of the same vision for the long term, and we were kind of getting at it from different angles. We, we don't have, for example, Microsoft Office, which is where people create most of their content. Now, I don't think most people will do it on their desktops. I think most people will do it in the web, but they're already building that. And so our strategy of building that product involved boiling the ocean. Like, we had to build everything. And that was really hard to figure it out. So they have these products. They, they for example, email. They have email. There clearly ha is a future where email has to help lead people into this world. It can't be so bifurcated. Uh, they have uh, uh, collaboration tools like Office and stuff that we don't have. And like, there's a billion Office documents, people working in Office, that like, if we could get them in this world. So they, they just have all of these assets that, that we didn't have. And they just, frankly, they have scale, right? Like, data centers around the world, data centers in China, you know, like, um, so the, they're, they're, like, we can focus on the things that we're really good at and not have to boil the ocean because they've sort of already boiled the ocean and have the resources to do so, you know? Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, uh, when you hire, sure, uh, so my name is Ben and I work at Google. So um, I was curious, uh, so uh, this idea of uh, distributed sort of teams working on stuff is, sounds really neat. And um, when, so do you have really smart um, people that are sort of excited about building stuff, sort of working on your product, and you have this distributed system, what do you do when people have uh, sort of conflicting ideas about, let's say, Team A wants to build this feature or you know, do mm. this to the culture, and then Team B wants to do something different? How, yeah. do, you, how do you sort of handle that? So it's interesting. There's a number of companies in, in Silicon Valley that are experimenting with very distributed development systems. Um, a lot of them are saying, well, anyone can kind of decide what to build. So what, what we 
do or decide it is, it's not about, we, we decentralize execution, but we've centralized vision and priorities because of that problem. And so we're, we're saying, look, we, we need to all be going in the same direction so we're not spinning our wheels. And as a startup, you have an existential risk. If you, if you waste time on the wrong things, you'll go out of business. And so like being so laser focused on what's most important right now and that changes was important, but then we decentralize execution. So the teams don't decide what to work on. They're formed around a feature. The team is formed to build a feature or an enhancement that was decided upon by everyone has ideas and, and everyone's idea because it's so transparent, you can just post to the product group. So a lot of people's ideas get built, but the order in which we build them and is sort of that piece of it is centralized because so that's kind of how we deal with it. Even though like h how we build it is decentralized, like people can, the team can decide how to do it and all that, but the order and the sort of what we're working on right now is, is decided by the company, so we make sure we're all moving in the same direction. Thank you. Uh, a few more? Uh, my name is Kahing. Um, I work at a company right now called Riverbed, but then in two weeks I'm going to go somewhere else. So, <laughs> congratulations! Uh, thank you. Or uh, I actually have two. No. Huh? Nothing. I actually have two questions um, for the people who are not um, doing our own startups right now. Um, so when you when you go into a, go into a startup and talk to the company, um, you only have a few hours to talk to them. You know, they interview you. You interview them. Um, how do you how do you judge a company on you know how successful it's going to be or you know whether it's worth your time? Because to be honest, you know, when I when I first heard about Yam a few years ago, I, I thought it's like, you know, what a stupid idea. And um, fooled you. I know, I know, I know. And I was wrong. And I I was wrong. I was wrong. So and I was wrong about you know Yam and I was wrong about a few other companies too. So, you know. Then when I when I go to another another startup and talk to them, you know, then what 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 things should I look for? Obviously it was wrong that you think. <laughs> well, I wanna be totally honest. I don't know that I or many people could predict what companies will be successful. I think that there are people who claim they can because they, they said, oh, I knew that one, was, but who knows? And, and I think it's a mistake to make that too much of your calculation because there's a greater than 90% chance that the company you go to is gonna fail. So you really should be looking at, all right, do, do I believe in the people? Do I like the people? Do I believe in the idea, the mission? Do I feel like I'll have an impact there? Those are the questions I think that are far more important. Will I be interested in the work? You know, all the, because who knows? Who know, like, who would have guessed Twitter? You know, who would like so many companies you could not have guessed if if you were like asked. To one go to, one of the other things I thought was a stupid idea was Twitter. Yeah, well, <laughs> guess they fooled you. Yeah, uh, it, it, and a lot of it's funny. A lot of my the uh, Chris Gale, who ends up he's our VP of engineering and all, he was hired right at the time Yammer was started, like literally like the week. And he was hired to work at Genie. And he got to work and we were like, hey, how about you work on Yammer? And he was like pissed. Because he was like, Yammer's gonna fail. I wanna work on Genie. He's, now he's pretty happy that he made the decision <laughs> that he made. But it's, it's impossible to know, you know? It's, and so you can't be, that can't be a big part of your calculation. Like I, you have a feeling for like, well this is a terrible idea. If you don't believe in the idea, you shouldn't do it. But there's no magic way to know the idea will be successful or not. Because even if it's a good idea, you don't know. Someone else could get there first. There could be a big company that takes the space. Like, it's just such a crapshoot. You have no idea. Um, second question. Uh, you mentioned that you should always hire people that who are smarter than you. Yeah. Then, but for people on the, the other side of the table, right? Why, why should anyone want to work for someone who's not as smart as you? <laughs> well, I clearly tricked them uh, <laughs> all. No, I... We were able to communicate the vision really well. And we were able to communicate not just the vision, but that like you are going to have an impact not only at this company, but at other companies. Because we believe in decentralization, because of the way we work, you're, you're going to come in and very quickly have like a lot of impact. And that was really interesting to people. We got really good people early on. We got engineers that applied at us and Twitter and us and that came to us because they, they could just really feel the passion of the people and that we were moving and making a difference and doing something. And again, even after the acquisition, you know, these startup people have stayed. We've had almost nobody has left because it's, they just love the company. They love working there and coming in and what they're doing. And uh, so I guess, again, I convinced, fooled them or something. I don't know. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. Thank you. All right. How many more do we have back here? Just, okay. Three. Great. And we'll, we'll, uh, we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, my name is Hadi. I'm also doing an en enterprise-based startup, and I think awesome. I have a million questions.
questions for you just <laughs> to learn from your experiences. Uh, but I think the key question, yeah, just one, of course. Uh, the key question I have, I think, is how did you gain traction? Because enterprise sales is extremely hard. Mm -hmm. And I think how did you get your first couple of users within companies and how did you convince companies to pay for your product? Well, it's simple. You start by winning TechCrunch 50. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> ugh, that's remind, it reminds me that I, I like read, um, I started reading, I shouldn't, I, I can pick on him. I, I started reading uh, Benioff's book. And uh, he's like, gets his playbook for how to be successful in the enterprise. And it's like, step one, know a billionaire. Step two, <laughs> take his money. And you're just like, wait a minute, I don't, ugh. Anyway, um, I, I am really excited about the enterprise space right now. I think that there's more opportunity there than in the consumer space. This transformation that's happening in companies means that almost all the old tools will be disrupted, all of them. And there are new, there, there are whole new categories of tools that were, will arrive because of it. I believe that the, the cloud itself and consumerization, and in fact, companies like us, have begun opening up those distribution channels in ways that, that they never have. We got in the way consumer companies did. We, we leveraged email and we got really good at, at virality. And in the beginning, we had three priorities for all features, virality, monetization, I'm sorry, virality engagement, monetization, in that order. And for two years, we focused on virality. We were adding value, but we'd only add value in ways that could get more users, and we were just hyper-focused on it. Uh, and so my suggestion is, A, just focus on simplicity and building the minimum product to see that you can get traction. Just, whatever your big idea is, just boil it down to the barest essentials, simpler than you can imagine possible, and just focus on the distribution piece, and you gotta figure that out. And I think there are different, I think Yammer will be opening it up for a lot of people. I think even like Box and a lot of companies are gonna be helping open up that classic distribution channel. Most companies, it's wise to start um, with SMBs and whatever and work their way up. We kind of randomly, accidentally started at the top of the chain, extraordinarily painful. We had to very quickly build out a sales force and all, and it's really difficult. But even that world is changing. Our salespeople are not, they're not like car salesmen, they're not IT salesmen. They're very consultative and solutions are trying to transform companies, not sell features. Uh, and that was a learning experience for us. And there aren't many of those people around. But, but I just think there's, I don't, there's no magic bullet, but at the same time, there's been, there's, no, there's been no better time than now and figuring out how, like what kind of products are in the way of this transformation, like that, that are just naturally gonna get hit. I mean, clearly we see some of them, move your files to the cloud, that's obvious. But there are so many more. And we see some of them, the Asanas, the, and they're not all going to be successful, but it's, it's the right play because there's a lot, there's a lot of money there. And, and I've argued, and this, this is so counterintuitive, that as a consumer, if you're building a consumer company, you often have um, a conflict of interest with your users. You want to give them the best product, but you've got to shove ads in their face, and they don't love that. As an enterprise product, you have no conflict, essentially, because you just build a great product and somebody else pays for it, and you don't have to make that trade-off. Now, you'll be forced to think about trade-offs, like IT wants you to make some crap feature or whatever. You just ignore that, and you just build a great product, you know? Uh, and so I, I, it's an exciting space. If, if I'm not investing in any enterprise companies right now, but uh, I, I can't imagine going into the consumer space right now. I'm, I'm sorry if some of you are in the consumer space. There's still lots of opportunity, uh, but I think that <laughs> The, the enterprise is still ripe, and I think that uh, obviously like the sort of physical disruption space is still ripe, whether it's DNA or whatever. Thank you. Sure. Two more. Hey, thanks a lot for a great talk. Thanks. Uh, so you mentioned with uh, the, you know, the first day that you were with Microsoft and kind of that they got it really quickly and that you were able to, and then again that you were able to communicate the vision really well in hiring. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what those first you know, few hours of that Microsoft meeting looked like and what you really went over that you, know, you said, okay, they really got it, let's throw away the agenda and kind of you know, start moving this conversation and, you know, and, yeah. and going back to kind of what that larger social vision was. Well, the, fir the first part in brief, it was interesting. You know, we, Yammer's success, we, we may have been successful either way, but a large part of our idea for why we could be successful was predicated on Microsoft being retarded, like and just not knowing the future and just being like stuck in their old ways. And so the first part of the meeting was just them telling us their vision and in fact very openly talking about their mistakes, about the, their products and their mistakes and then their vision. And so on one hand it was like, oh my God, they share our vision. On the other hand it was terrifying because it was like, oh, they're not retarded. They actually, 
you know, the giant has awoken and they're moving in the right direction, like really in the right direction. Um, so that was sort of like what helped. And then, and then it was just the amount of interest they had in not the revenue, not even the product per se, but it was just in like how we did it, you know, like what was the development like and how do we deal with users and, and how do we think about iterative data-driven development and how we deal with the, the customer that isn't IT. And so just like, oh yeah, they really are thinking of this the right way. Because alternatively, it could have been like, we're Microsoft, we don't have social enterprise, we'll buy them, click, you know, check, and it just wasn't that at all. Um, but the, and the vision, frankly, was what I'm saying to you, which is like there's a fundamental shift going on and companies are just fundamentally changing. And you need, you're good, every, every single company of all size is gonna need a product like this that, that where they can communicate, collaborate, create content in an open and transparent way, in a way that's self-organizing, that's, that's not completely controlled top down or by IT, and they just totally got it. And, and they didn't quite have that themselves at the time, you know, and we were both going in that direction. I'll be silent about this. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, last question. Yeah, so I'm totally new to this space and I'm kind of showing up to things like this just because like I'm trying to get more ideas and energy. Uh, my name's Teresa and my company, which still needs to be incorporated or LLC'd or something, is called Redesign. Um, in any case, uh, I've been working on something for like three years while I've been doing another job and then um, I noticed that like it's kind of hard like if you don't have like a road map like for your idea because my idea just kind of seems out there sometimes but then like whenever I tell my friends about it like they love it they're like you need to do this but then I I try to go places where I can find people to sort of uh, keep me inspired or help me like make ways to make things work and I guess my I question to you is like were there ever times where you're up my first question to you is were there ever times where you're up kind of late at night like how am I going to make this work like I've got to create the thing and I've got to create the roadmap and I have no idea how to do that and like how did you address that and then the second question is like now you said you work all the time so like I'm just wondering like how do you have like you know sports or hobbies or like how do you have your relationship all that stuff how, yeah. do you man how do you manage that if you're working all the time? Yeah, well, uh, so the first question was about, uh, I'm sorry, no, I was like this stuck on that it, second what question. Were you, were you up late oh, at yeah, night so trying to make it work? And I'll, I'll tell you, maybe myself and David Sachs are polar opposites in almost every way. And one of the ways is me and Kristen and Zach, like we are people that focus on failure. That's how we succeed which sounds crazy, right? Like, um, Chris has the saying, which is winning feels like losing, because the way you win is by focusing on where you're losing and improving, you know? Uh, and, and, and I have this, when I'm teaching someone to climb or whatever, I have this joke, like, visualize failure and then don't do that, you know? Which I don't recommend, actually, but um, I am constantly amazed in, in this area in Silicon Valley on the optimism, which I think is a good thing, because even though I focus on failure, clearly we had to have unbelievably naive, blind optimism that we could do it. And I think that's the, the magic um, cognitive dissonance of a startup person is like to be able to focus on failure as a way to improve and then just have irrational belief in what you're doing. It's irrational, you know, and so much that other people believe you too because they have to. And so it, and it's, it's literal just cognitive dissonance and it's, it's really hard and in fact, this idea of sort of focusing on failure, it's highly unsatisfying because it, you, you're, you don't have time to celebrate your successes as you're on to the next failure. You've got to improve. Um, and so there was a lot of sort of like brief moments of stepping back and saying, you know, actually we're doing a pretty good thing here. This isn't all bad. Um, but at the same time, I think that a lot of, frankly, startups fail because they, they kind of don't have that approach. They think, build it and they will come or like, no, yes, maybe you'll get lucky. Maybe you'll, you'll stumble on a bag of money and whatever. But most of the time, it's unbelievably hard work. You don't even know when to quit because it's, it sucks for so long. Like there's, it's just super hard. It's very stressful. Why would anyone do this? I, it escapes me, you know? I think there's plenty of good jobs and companies that are fun and stable and don't involve so much heartache and but that's, it's like who, who we are, I guess. It's the kind of people that, 
they just know no other way. I, I just know no other way. I can't do something and not put so much of myself into it that it, it slowly destroys me, you know. But that's, <laughs> which I guess leads me to the second question. What's your second which question? Is, which is, um, yeah. you know, How I'm, do you have a life? I, I don't have much of a life. I, I, uh, I got into a, mountain bike, a road biking last year. I, I, I climb and snowboard and road bike, and I, I was in pretty good shape before the accident, and then I, I kind of was doing a lot of PT. And so my life was really PT and work and then some sleep, you know. Uh, and now I, I'm trying to get back into it, and, but it involves, like, getting up early in the morning and, like, on the weekend knowing you want to sleep, but you're going to get up and do stuff. And so uh, and now I'm finally, I just, like, my bike got stolen a couple, uh, month or two ago. It sucked. So I just bought a new bike. So I start biking again, and you just—it's it, hard because you—you. You, I, I think this is an important point. You have to have some sort of work-life balance, and I don't mean uh, you shouldn't work hard. I mean you kind of have to force yourself to do things other than work, even if you're, you have no balance whatsoever. So it's not about like I'm going to only work nine to five. Or it's not even like I was. You force yourself to wake up early and do stuff because you need your brain needs. Um, other thoughts to help contextualize anything you're doing. And so I, like I got really into road biking because you can't do anything else while you're road biking. So it's, you know, our jobs and startups are so frenetic and you're whatever, and it's important to be able to be still and you're just biking, you know, yeah. And so, you know, I, I found it really meditative for me. Some people do yoga. I find uh, climbing's pretty meditative because you can't really think about other things while you're climbing. So it's very, very important, but it doesn't mean if you're a startup person, it's almost impossible to not work a lot, and, and, and there's no reason to force that. Um, but it doesn't have to force yourself to do other things. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to wrap up.